Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 457, being recorded on July 12th, 2017. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Jeremy Holstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Alan Malventano. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's uh, I'm back here. I'm no longer in the backwoods of North Carolina. I guess technically that's not the backwoods. I was on the beach. So can you be in the backwoods of a beach? That yeah. That doesn't make any sense. I, it, it was super secluded where we were at. So we were down at Hatteras Island on the outer banks of uh, North Carolina. Uh, but, of course, everybody knows that there's just OBX based on the stickers oh, that people God, put on the back of their cars. God, I hate that stuff. Um but I had been to the Outer Banks once before. I don't know if you guys had ever been to like Kitty Hawk. Uh, Nags Head is like at the top. Kitty Hawk, famous for uh, where the first flights occurred yep. with the Wright brothers and all that stuff. And they have a, a really cool kind of like museum and, and area there. You can walk the field where they they measured off how far each flight was. And that stuff. So it, it's pretty cool. cool. Where my buddy lives is literally two and a half hours straight south. Okay. On like... 30 mile an hour, 35 mile an hour roads, two lanes, yeah, all the way down. Backwards where Literally, it's 30 minutes from house to anything that sells groceries. Yep. And uh, I'm not a fan of that, <laughs> as it turns out. Like, for a week is fine. A week is fine. Because you, you just you, like the <laughs> Amazon uh, Prime Now he, stuff Everything food? he buys is Amazon. His UPS... Uh, UPS too, right? Uh, as much as he can get. Yeah, Because, yeah, yeah. I, I, like, they probably can't do Amazon Fresh type stuff. So his UPS guy hates him? Well, probably not. It keeps him in, in business. It's like a else. loading dock at his house. Yeah. Well, I see, like I happen to be coming back from the beach. The milk and cookies for the delivery guy. Well, yeah. the UPS guy walked up and he was dropping up. He said, you don't live here. I said, I don't. My butt is my buddy's house. He says, okay, well, you know, I'll just leave this here for him. I said, okay. And I asked him, I said, you hear a lot? And he goes, every damn day. <laughs> so, okay. UPS driving 30 mile an hour. And hour literally, hours. that was our second to last day there. The day we left and the other other groups were still there, uh, some, there was like three boxes on their door. And he took a picture of it and sent it to me and my buddy and said, every damn day. And I said, fair enough. Uh, so funny. welcome to the show where we talk about computer hardware, not just remote beach locations. Yeah. Um, we do record the show on Wednesday nights, 10 p.m. Oops, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Uh, uh, when at at pcper.com slash live. It's a URL on the internet. It's a website. You can go to it, and you can see our stream and our chat room, and you can interact with us and talk with everybody. And it's super fun and awesome, and all the great things that you go along with it. Uh, if you need a little reminder about our streams coming up you can go to pcper.com slash subscribe you get this page it asks for your name and your email address and we just send you a notification you know the day of the hour of that we're going to do a live stream uh, whether it be our podcast or some other event last week was it last week two weeks ago we did the rx vega two weeks ago it was two weeks ago the rx vega not rx the radeon vega frontier edition live stream that actually got a huge amount of attention um i don't think we ever mentioned the podcast we had Two websites were live blogging our stream. And they were taking screen caps of the, oh, benchmarks, the benchmarks we results. would take and they yeah. would add it to their website and do this. And was, uh, at first I was like, that's kind of neat because it's like they're, they're making a log for me of all the stuff that I'm saying and doing. And then I just realized they just basically stole all of my graphs and put it on their website as mm. a picture or whatever. It all got taken care of and, and removed and taken down. But um, uh, it was interesting that there was a lot more interest in that than I expected there to be. I say that because on Friday we're getting the water cooled version, and there's a very there's a very small chance that we do a live stream with that. It's a very small, very small chance, uh, depending on what time it shows up and what else I appear to be doing that day. I don't expect there to be a huge difference from the air cooled version to the water cooled version, especially because uh, I know Steve over at Gabriel's Nexus kind of like attached a water cooler already to it and, and all that type of stuff. So it doesn't seem to light the world on fire. Uh, but I'm still gonna freaking paid for the thing so i'm gonna do a freaking review on yeah. this 1537 dollars with freaking. shipping video card um mine as well oh yeah i can't return it i mean yeah new egg has no returns even if i don't open this product i'm allowed to return it. it i'm gonna sell it to somebody in this chat room at the end of the show they don't have, just, they don't have returns on just gpus period is that what it is um i think is that true ken they, they started return a no other returns things. i don't know like the in the four, last two on the months last I bought. month they were no returns. I don't know about other GPUs. I think it's. I think it's. It's. It's a new policy for GPUs with the most recent mining crap Makes sense. that occurred. Right. So you can't just buy it, mine with it for twenty nine days, and send it back and buy another one. That I think is shady. If you're going to go twenty nine days, just well, keep the damn card. No, that that's why they're doing. 
exchanges only, no returns. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. That, that's They're trying to prevent that type of stuff. Yeah, I can exchange it. People in the chat's asking if it's DOA, I can return it. Yeah, yeah, they'll let me exchange it. But they'll I send just you another one. I, yeah, they'll just send me another one. <laughs> I can just keep exchanging it and keep getting as many different as I want, and maybe I could see with the variance of overclockability <laughs> of all these cards. Ryan goes through 15, all of New Egg stock of Vega yeah. water cold ones. Uh, also, we have uh, our Patreon campaign ongoing at patreon.com slash pcper. Uh, this is your place if you feel like uh, we do cool and interesting stuff and you want to directly contribute to us, right, on a kind of a monthly recurring option, right? You can pledge one, three, five, ten, twenty, whatever you want to do per month. Uh, there are options available for for that there. And there's a good description on the site about why we do it and, and why it helps and uh, and all that type of stuff. So uh, anybody who can support us through that is is super, super awesome. We greatly appreciate it. And is, as is always the case, uh, if you increase or become a patron during the show, I will read your name off uh, and thank you personally for it. For example... Travis Stern, as we were starting the stream, edited their pledge from 333 to 555. I don't know if there's a significance Cheers, mate. to uh, to that, but thank you very much, Travis. Skip, skip, they're trying to skip get, the sixes, dude. They're trying to get Josh That's to, true. to say those things, but they're not using the magic number. Maybe he'd upgrade from a Core i3 or a Ryzen 3 to a Ryzen 5, and next week he can upgrade to the Ryzen 7. All right. You never know. Hmm. Never know. So thank you guys for that. It's uh, it's it's very welcome. So if uh, anybody wants to contribute to that again, patreon.com slash PC per greatly appreciated. So let's get into the news of the week. We're going to start with there's a bunch of different things. We've got Xeon launches, uh, uh, a Thunderbolt GPU testing. We didn't talk about this last week. I thought no. it was I have three stories this week. So you're welcome. We're keeping the site alive. Oh, thank crap. you. Yeah. How many did he say he had Alan? more than me? Josh, how many did Ken say he had? More than me? No. Oh. <laughs> but I got one in the queue. Jeremy, More than me and Jeremy Josh. you post a lot of news, Together. so I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, well, I, I can beat him in a day. But <laughs> fair. Fair. Uh, so let's talk about first the Xeon Scalable processor launch. I'm not a huge fan of this name, Xeon yeah. Scalable, yeah. Uh, but that's what they're, they're, they're kind of moving away from just Xeon to Xeon Scalable. Um, they're getting rid of their naming scheme is different. They're no longer... Um, E5, E7. Did they go up? Did they do E3 before? I don't remember. Yeah, they had E3s. Before. Are they getting yep. rid of the V2, V3, V4 crap too? Yes. Yes. So mm -hmm. now we're uh, Xeon, platinum, gold, bronze, uh. sil bron gold, silver, bronze. Uh, by the way, this is I, I. I sent you guys this picture when I first saw these a few weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, privately, obviously, it was because it was still under embargo. But this is the yeah. Except you edited out the really good stuff. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Never mind. <clears throat> For scale. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is a normal size business card over here on your left, and these are processors. Um, the one with the weird dangly thing, piece of PCB sticking out the side, is the one with uh, Omnipath fabric built onto it. Yeah, obviously very specialized for high end server configurations, but just the size of the processor is substantial. Um, the the if you want the, the basics of this is that this is the Skylake SP upgrade for Xeon. So this is the Skylake architecture refresh for Xeon. We came from Broadwell to Xeon. Or I'm sorry, from Broadwell to Skylake. Yep. In the same way we just recently went from Broadwell uh, E to Skylake X on the HEDT high-end consumer side, right? Um, with that, you get the same kind of performance enhancements with a little bit of additional stuff added into it, right? So you've got the new core architecture, the mesh architecture we've talked about. Um, you're getting what they call socket level performance improvement, which basically means up more cores per socket. Now you're up to 28 cores instead of, I think before they maxed out like 24 cores per socket, mm -hmm. I believe is right. Um, they've changed from QPI to UPI, QPI standing for quick path interconnect. What's the what's the ultra path? I thought you were supposed to see a doctor about UPI. Yeah, it's yeah, it's you just should ultra. Should. Not even ult, not no, even. No ultra. Yeah, ultra path. But ultra what? Ultra path. That's an ultra path. Yeah. It's ultra ultra. So the ultra is not even talking about the speed. It's talking about the path. It's ultra speed. It's just implied. Oh. <laughs> um, <Okay. laughs> so you get more. Uh, you get 
more, more PCIe faster, lanes. You get a new chipset that has more PCIe lanes. Um, there's some interesting things like uh, you can actually have a dedicated six by sixteen connection to the chipset to allow for further expansion and better utilization of that. So you're not just depending on D on DMI 3.0, right? So they upgrades to DMI 3.0 on this one, just like Skylake X does. Yeah, but you can take advantage of 16 of those lanes, direct connect to that chipset so that you have... That's like four times yeah. DMI3. Yeah, yeah. so if, if you're connecting things to that chipset, then you can take advantage of it that way. Huh. There, there's a whole bunch of different configurations. We've talked about the mesh architecture already. This gives you an overview of the differences between like platinum, gold, silver, bronze. You know, you get platinum as the highest core counts, highest socket counts up to eight, three UPI links up to uh, DDR42666, up to 1.5 terabytes of memory per socket. Sweet. Mm -hmm. uh, which is substantial. Um, and then you go down to gold, which is up to 22 cores, only up to four threads, you know, those types of things. When you get down into, uh, this, this may be a little bit easier way of looking at it as well. When you get down into like gold, you're up to 14 cores. Gold, it's even more dumb because gold is broken up into the 6100 series and the 5100 series. So the gold 61s go up to 22 cores with three UPI links. The gold 5100 series is up to 14 cores with two UPI links. Um, it's weird that it goes okay, all the way down let, to... Let me ask this. Oh. Yes, you may. Is stop... Is shop keeping these SKUs going to be insane? Thankfully, Intel has a, for, a terrific database called ARC. They do a, a magnificent job with this in terms of yeah. making it searchable. Uh, allow you to do yeah, but I'm talking about, comparisons. hey, I need this core. Who do I talk to? Well, we don't carry that one. We only have eight SKUs. Oh, sure. And so you yeah. got to pick out of those. Here is you mean a you skew don't list. have the fifty six other ones. Here, oh, well, that's a big picture. Uh, let me go back here. This is the skew list, and so, if you're looking at home and you can't read any of it, <laughs> that's not an accident. Supposedly, it's, it's otherwise uh, known as the towering inferno of graphs. Yes. Supposedly, the address, uh, the ra addressable RAM is limited to seven hundred eighty six gig unless you pay like a three grand premium for a yeah, different so, skew. So Correct. the Platinum 1.5 terabyte is the M series of processors. Uh -huh. And if you get the non-M series, you're limited to 768, not whatever you said. Okay, so so you, half of the 1. M stands 5. for yeah, yeah. money. The M stands for memory. <laughs> money. But yes, right? They're literally adding one more address line. Yep. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. It's an expensive address. Hey, but if one, you need one more terabyte, now, it's a rare, you're no, going to pay for it. To be fair, like the memory, in order to support 1.5 terabyte, you have to support a different type of DIMM. That's higher density. That's true. That maybe I don't. I don't. I'm just making it's this up. It's not three grand maybe worth of. Uh, hey, IP. we don't want to qualify these other sixty-seven you, you SKUs. You might, you on might this be memory, binning so. your memory controller to support that. Maybe. 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 I'm just you know benefit of the doubt. I don't really know. Three, I agree. Three grand, three grand is a lot. <laughs> but again, but here's the thing. Here, so uh, I'm gonna let me let me skip to the pricing stuff because this I want. We'll so come back to all this well, the, later. The, the but I, I wanted to say this. Me. The, I wanted to say this in the pricing. These start at thirteen thousand dollars. Oh, start! No, no, like at the highest. No, it's okay. You said at the start. highest. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, their peak is thirteen thousand, <laughs> right? For the one point five terabytes, you can go down to fifty two hundred for the one point five terabytes. Uh -huh. The person who is worried about getting one point five terabytes per socket uh -huh. of memory does not give a crap about a five thousand no, or no, seven thousand, no. even thirteen thousand yeah. dollar processor, right. because they're spending ten times that on memory. Yeah. If not more, yeah, and then whatever else they're building the system for, yeah, right. So uh, you know, it is funny that this comes out after. Uh, remember, we were briefed on Intel's like you know Optane thing, mm -hmm. where they were trying to displace 768 gig of memory in a server with 128 gig and using Optane SSDs. Oh, right. To you know try to augment that and get most of the performance benefit. So I'm going to scroll so, down through this list I'm so you sure can Intel see. I'm sure Intel would be fine with losing the price premium if they could sell them Optane instead of having them buy DRAM from somewhere that else. That is true because you're also spending true. like, you know, I'm still several going. thousand dollars. still the same table. There we go. Um, there were, I believe there are 58, yep. 54, 58, 58 processors launched, different SKUs. So it's weird that it goes all the way down to bronze and yet bronze still has six channels of DDR. So they all have six channel DDR4 memory, but you go down to 2133 memory yeah. speeds. Yeah. Bronze is, you know, up to, only up to eight cores. There's no turbo boost on no, it. Turbo, that's interesting. It's yeah. only in eight cores. It's like CPU. the core i3 of but Xeon. I, it almost has more DDR channels than it has cores. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. Like uh, and the, you know, the, the other differentiating point is the gold 6100 and above has two FMAs per 
for I, uh, for AVX 512, whereas below that yeah. you get a single FMA. Yeah. So you know you're cutting your throughput in half. For AVX instructions. For AVX instructions, yes, yeah. correct. Um, architecturally, you know, I, I don't feel like we need to spend a whole lot of time on this. Again, the Skylake X, Broadway Elite Skylake X differences, most of it apply. You get the new cache structure, um, although there are a lot more cache options mm -hmm. for the Xeon the yeah. Xeon family. Um, there are some microarchitecture enhancements, including the out-of-order windows and, and uh, allocation queues and things like that uh, that come into play. AVX 512, much more important in this space than in the consumer HEDT space that we talked about it before. Yeah, your typical piece of desktop software is not going to be using AVX. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, video encoding and transcoding might be something that does. Sure. Right? Uh, I know, for example, like Handbrake integrated AVX2 really early in the lifespan of AVX2. Yeah. So, so yes, you're right, but there's there's the uh, the standouts there too. Mm -hmm. uh, this is interesting because actually somebody we were at the briefing and um, there's this dagger in the Skylake core and then there's like this L2 cache out to the side and this AVX up top, and somebody just kind of like jokingly asked like, well, that's not really how it looks like. That guy's like. Actually, it's pretty close. <laughs> like we pretty much out a picture of like the die. Pretty much, like, hey, pretty much, we had this core, and we just needed to add L2 cache to it. We needed to extend AVX, so we just bolt, bolt, bolt. kind of tacked it on right. and uh, wired it in. Did they glued it on? No, no, oh. absolutely not. It's all <laughs> monolithic. Definitely not glued. Um, you know, they talk about different AVX clock speeds because you're using more power. Um, the uh, uh, home agent and the caching agents are actually divided up per core. Um, on this mesh network, mm -hmm. which basically spreads it out. So on average, the access time between any given core and any given place of memory or uh, its access to a, a home agent yeah. of some kind, which would connect you to memory or whatever, is less than in the previous generation. But they still have like the discussions we had about Skylake X where, you know, uh, the latencies were a little bit worse at the maximum mm -hmm. in order to improve the average still applies here yeah. to the to the Xeon scalable uh, release. And they have some slides in here that go over like cache misses and and what gets better and and, and what gets worse. They're, they're fairly the table is just insanely long. You're looking at the at the part uh, table still the, the table on page UPI, two. UPI, uh, the ultra path interconnect, not terribly different. Um, it does move up the max speed from nine point six to ten point four gigatransfers per second. Uh, but not, it's not doing it jump. at lower power. Oh, okay. um, so it's on that. They they have this thing called Intel Volume Management Device, which is not VROC storage. VROC. It is for storage, nope. but this is kind of what enables VROC. Oh. Uh, the oh, uh, it's like the pathway, not it's the, the rate it's, implementation on top of it. It's Correct. the architecture that that lets you. The VMD do the is other what things. they call the integrated endpoint that stops OS enumeration of devices under it. Okay, right. So it handles everything else at that point. Uh -huh. But you still have to have drivers for the drives yeah. installed and all that type of stuff. But it I mean, it kind of helps map the different NVMe PCIe devices under one yeah. tree. Yeah, it does. It, it, it's just a CPU doing the same thing that like a chipset would normally do for if you set up a RAID. Yeah. Because usually the yeah. chipset intercepts it, but now you have things can, you know hanging directly off the CPU. So the Intel VMD driver sets up and manages the domain, enumerates event error handling, yeah. but out of the fast IO paths. So in yeah. theory, if you're Facebook, you would write your own driver on top of this for the specific IO needs you have instead of using Intel's VROC implementation, probably. You could. Yeah, yeah, like I want to be able to address these SSDs in this, this specific way. What's yeah. the closest hop I can get to them? Yeah. Do that sort of thing, yep. probably. Yeah. They've improved turbo profiles, implemented speed shift, uh, but obviously in a very, it's not as, you, it's, it's useful in a different context than in consumers. Right. In consumers, for speed shift, you want uh, uh, interactivity. You want usability, like right. bursty workloads. Right. For servers, it's not really the case. But you can basically use speed shift to um, shift between what they call what they call energy performance preferences. So um, do you want the ramp up to be higher, slower, or faster to get to that max clock speed mm -hmm. type of thing? So you, there's a little bit of a... And so you can... Choose it? manage that. Yeah, oh. I don't know. I don't know if that's a software driver or a firmware level thing. You know, huh. that was requested by a lot of uh, cloud vendors um, and specifically application integrators because you could tune the turbo profile and reduce your latency for a request without increasing your power footprint. So they actually okay. use management to tweak that. Huh. It's really, really. I send you guys white paper. It's a really good read. Okay. Cool. Uh, they have some with the integrated fabric we talked about. I don't, you know, I, 
I don't know a whole bunch about the Omnipath stuff, but it, this is That's isn't, just an insane throughput yeah, thing. It's 16 lanes of PCIe. That's how this Omnipath connection connects to the uh, processor die directly. Yeah. This is this kind of a way to implement it. And it's at a system level, you can actually design boards that can support this processor and not the Fabric version, like both, but it's, you know, a little bit different there. Um, there are three different die configurations for this. Three different monolithic chips that were made. The XCC die is the one that goes up to 28 cores. It has a six by six mesh, five rows of core and LLC, um, two three channel memory controllers on either side. And it's interesting to talk about like the physical layout of this becoming more important as you look at these topologies in 28 cores, how quickly can each core access a memory controller? It yeah. becomes very important. Um, three by 16 PCIe gen stacks, one by 16 PCIe for MCP use, like we were talking about before and up to three Intel UPIs. And then they also have the HCC up to 18 core and the LCC up to 10 core. Um, so you can just kind of see like, this is how they're they're binning and, and producing and, and all that type of stuff. I have, a, I have a mesh related question that might you, you might not actually have been briefed on the answer to. Sure. So if you're looking at any of those drawings with yep. the different meshes, right? Yeah. So if you're trying to get up to a memory controller, which it looks like is along the top there. No, the memory controllers are the gray on the sides. Oh, the ground sides, okay. Yeah, so. Yeah. So say you're trying to get, you know, up to the left memory controller and you're at the core that's in the same line, but on the, all the way on the right. Yep. Is the horizontal mesh row looking thing? One like is, is that a bus? So that's one hop. Yep. Okay. So they're buses. You're, you're not... at most two hops from anything on this. Right. Because it's an okay. X and a Y. Yes. Correct. Okay. Okay. So each thing is, you wouldn't have to keep hopping core, core, core across one line. No. It's literally just a bus that traverses across all this. So there's an X shaped or cross-shaped bus that passes yes. through every yes. single item. Yes, and, that, and, it, and it, the diagram is, it's difficult to diagram something like that, but that's supposed to be the right. indication of the arrows that like are looping at, at both locations. Okay. But yes. So that's, okay, so that's even faster than I was imagining it when I first saw, I started so. to see this yeah. mesh thing, right? It's like city planning. Ugh, the worst. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Except every road will instantaneously get you to anywhere along if you, that road. If yeah. you look back at our yeah. mesh story and look at the mesh versus um, ring yeah. interface, you'll see like city planning when you were designing for eight streets. And this, you say, oh, crap, now we have 24 streets. <laughs> right. Right, and how do we do this? And this is kind of like, okay, we're designing for 28. Now, what, where do they go from here? It may still get more complex. But, yeah. you know, uh, there's a new chipset, uh, uh, a.k.a. Lewisburg, the C620. There's like all kinds of iterations of this. This is essentially the X299 chipset slash Z270 chipset, like capabilities in terms of you get 20 lanes of PCIe 3.0. The previous chipset had eight lanes of PCIe 2. Um, this is pretty cool in that it also integrates four 10 gigabit Ethernet Phi on it. On where? On, on the chipset. Just inside the chipset. Yeah. Okay. Right. So quad 10 gig. Yep. Uh, or one 100 gig, I think. 140 the, gig, probably. Uh, Intel was Yeah, doing no, no. Four, <laughs> 410 or 4 1 gig. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I wonder if it if that's the one that could be actually ganged together and just be considered 40 gigabit. Probably. Intel was showing that off like a couple oh, of years ago. This is the Intel so, Ethernet yeah. Connection X722. Well, do you have enough bandwidth over DMI to do that? If you don't well, use that by 16 thing? Mm. Uh, 40 yeah, the fabric thing's different. Yeah. Well, so you're talking about like is four lanes of PCIe enough for 40 gigabit? The answer is, would be no. 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 Yeah. But it would have to use the other 16 lane thing or whatever. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Yes. And they and they Presumably. show this. So they've got quick assist technology in here, which is kind of interesting. It's basically the chipset has a dedicated um, crypto and compression hardware accelerator in it to. Uh, offload the CPU and allow you to do kind of like bulk crypto on these network connections and or storage connections, okay. which is kind of neat. Um, and of course, there's like seven different chipsets as well to compare with all these. Uh, and you can see different chipsets will support, um, let's see. Yeah, you, you know, some of the, the base models don't support 10 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, the quick assist capabilities in these chipset differs, right, on what their throughput, maximum throughput can be. Um, you know, weird stuff like that. And then you get your max PCIe uplink, you know, which is what's supported back to the processor or whatever. And they have different thermal loads and all kinds of weird stuff. Performance wise, we didn't get processors in for testing yet. We're working on getting them. Um, but it's a pretty serious freaking lineup. 
like in specs and everything. We like want one just, of all mm -hmm. of them. One of each. We want to test all 58. <laughs> it's just and surprising. Really take it like, you know, so here's the not thing. only that, but you need all the chipsets as well. Oh, and yeah, yeah. now you can do a matrice of Shoot how out. many tests you need to perform to cover the entire spectrum of The parts. answer is zero because yeah. I quit. <laughs> I'm going to sell all that crap and, yeah. you know, Cash in. retire. I'm going to retire. So they talk yeah. about performance, uh, 1.65x average generational gains on two socket servers. Now, the problem with that is they're comparing the E5 2699 V4, which is a $4,000 processor, to the, I believe, uh, 8100 or $10,000 8180 the, processor. Uh, the Three quarter of a terabyte version of the correct, not the one point five terabyte, the, which version. is an extra three k. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. So because they don't want to overdo it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, most of these benchmarks that might not have helped. The, the point being that um, there are generational performance gains, but they are not at the same price level. Yeah. Right. So you're not getting one point seven, one point six five x at the same price. Well, I think they picked the highest one because they were trying to, like, like, um, you know specify or signify or whatever that like look this is the one with the most number of cores correct which you would think would have the most disadvantage because there's so many cores trying to talk interestingly to the e5 2699 v4 is a 22 core part not the maximum of last generation i think there's a 24 core but it might be at significantly lower clock speed so that may be the highest performance part yeah um that they had in, in broadwell e so we already went through the the giant list of stuff this is it's a really interesting launch because um Epic exists now. It does. And uh, I don't think anybody, even AMD, is going to tell you that they're even attempting to address the same number and vari variance of spaces that Intel will address with uh, uh, the Xeon scalable line. Well, is Epic going to have uh, CCXs, as far as we understand? What do you mean? Core complexes? Like, is yes. that our It's, it's, a, a lot it's of the them. exact same thing. It has to have core, oh, yeah. just more of them. It's, it's four zendai on one package okay that's how you get to 32 cores yeah, yeah, so yeah. like into amd will have an advantage on core count over uh the xeons but sure. xeons are going to have you know better single threaded capability so in total i would expect and a 28 core processor to uh the 28 core xeon platinum to outperform the 32 core uh epic 7401 7601 whatever it is um but that's a $4,000 part versus a $10,000 part. Yeah. Right? So there's AMD is going to be super, super competitive in these spaces. I think, uh, Alex, you posted in our in our chat today some... I don't, where'd you, I don't know where you got these comparisons from or if you made them up yourself. Those, those were just ballpark. Uh, in, the, in the chat, someone's saying there's... Uh, Chris and M's already saying there are uh, already benchmarks, supposedly. Oh, no, no. Like, uh, Tom's Hardware did, like, benchmark testing on this. A non-tech non non did. did, yeah. Um, but, but the interesting thing is... Uh, testing a server processor is very different than testing yeah. anything else, right? And, and it's uh, very yeah. much so about like workloads and specific. Yeah. It, it, and it's almost not all about the processor performance as much as it is the platform capability and all that too, which is which is obviously very difficult to get into. And so you just kind of have yeah. to do your CPU benchmarks and then say you really have to and consider you have to consider the full implementation package, which is hard to do yeah. in any kind of um, reasonable time frame and also in any kind of kind of what am I looking for? Like something that encompasses a bunch of different ideas. Yeah. Um, but Alex put in here, like the Epic uh, 7601, two sockets is 64 cores, right? 8,200 bucks for the parts. That's the leaked price. Yeah. No, that's real. It is real? Yeah. That's yeah, confirmed? Yeah. That's real. Okay. Um, the Xeon 6130, which is one of those 58 parts that came out today <laughs> of the gold <laughs> class, which is a, Quad, if you put it in a quad socket system uh -huh. of 16 cores each, you get same 64 core count total. And how much is that? $7,600. So it's actually a little bit less. But consider well, you're, you're going a from a dual board, board to a quad board, which is incredibly different price point, incredibly, yeah. incredibly different form factor, yeah. really. Yeah. And the things that you can put in it and attach to it are very different yeah. as well. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff that kind of, that kind of goes into it. Um, but it's interesting to see that, you know, Intel's not stupid. They understand that they understand two things. One, they have a huge dominance in this market. They they're they're ninety nine point five percent of the market today. So there's one a couple things from that. One, they know they're going to lose market share this year because some people are going to buy Epic, and so by default you're going to lose some of that market share. Um, 
but they also they're also smart enough to realize that like okay we, all we need to do is have some specific answer to that epic 7601 and maybe that's it maybe that's that quad implementation that alex kind of put together right mm. it's not perfect and there's lots of different variances here I, th- I really think amd will do very well with epic and single socket and two socket systems yeah and i mean there's an epic single socket skew that's 32 cores for like under two grand yes yeah yeah which is incredible and and Intel didn't, all these processors are up, the minimum is like, minimum support is two sockets, right? Um, so they didn't release any like single socket Xeons, which they have done in the past, right? Parts that well, are you intended always, for single socket. You could always put a intended multiple socket yes. Xeon in a single socket Correct, board. but those are inherently would yeah. be higher cost or higher yeah. price. Yeah, you're wasting an right? awful lot of QPI yeah, yeah. links. Yeah, yeah. Stuff. So, you know, I... I it's it's super interesting. I, you know, I don't have a whole lot else to say until we actually get our hands on parts and start to look at at performance and maybe um, start to see kind of systems released with these configurations in place. Uh, but uh, I think it'll be sooner sooner rather than later. So, uh, fifty eight processors launched, guys. Small so, day. Small so here, day. here's a stupid question. <laughs> it's not really applicable to most people. The the fabric skews, the Dash F fabric skews. Mm-hmm, they mm-hmm. have an X sixteen hanging off the processor PCB. If you have those in a quad socket or an octo socket setup, you can you pull off four or eight fabric links to the backhaul? I mean, I guess in theory. But see, when you get into that, you're talking about uh, you know, not bare bones systems or motherboards you're buying. You're oh, no, you're, no. you're looking at specific like HP's building a system for Cray or whoever it's going to be, mm-hmm. right? Um so I don't see how that wouldn't I don't see why that wouldn't be possible for them to do. It's just a matter of how much are you going to pay for that implementation, right? The idea of eight sockets of this size on a single system in general kind of boggles my mind, like how it even (laughs) physically fits and then how you get enough dim channels to attach to each of those to support close to the maximum capacity of the the CPU. That's where the the fiber comes in. put all your dims on risers. (laughs) It, it, the, the fiber comes in that way because you don't have yeah. anything else inside that system ever possibly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I, I assume they could. They didn't mention anything about it. But if it, if it were a detriment, they probably wouldn't. So I don't know. Uh, next up, Ken did a little testing with the external graphics adapter over Thunderbolt three called the. Akitio. Sure. Why not? I've never heard it pronounced. <laughs> ah, Akitio. The Akitio node. Yes. Is that what this is? So this is, is this just like the bare bones Thunderbolt 3 GPU dock? Absolutely. You can scroll down. There's an internal shot with the graphics card. Oh, you can't really see. Well, you can see on the inside, not, not a whole lot going on. There's essentially <laughs> a, like a Thunderbolt 3 controller hooked up to a by 16 slot, a 400 watt SFX power supply in it. And that's it. And a crap load of empty space for some reason. Yeah. yeah. So that's a 580 in that photo, but I had a 1080i in there that I tested, and there was still three inches of extra space at the end, which kind of begs the question of why this thing needed to be, like, this is literally the size of a bread box. Uh, like, yeah. Maybe they just had metal in that shape already? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> better safe than sorry. You like, just make a, it a little bigger, I guess. You can almost do a mini ITX build in that. I, there are smaller mini ITX yeah. chassis yeah. than this expansion <laughs> chassis, so I... Yeah. So how, how much was it, did you say again? Uh, it's right around 300 bucks. Okay. It's still, it still seems pricey for what it is, but yeah. that's the least expensive that exists. They're coming out correct? with like a Node light for like two something, I think. I don't exactly know what the limitation is. I think it might be power supply. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, it's got to have a decent power supply in it. So this is no, like there's no USB there's no ports USB, on, yes. there's no, no uh, there's network one connections. one port and a power jack in the back, and that's okay. it. Okay. All right, that's, so no just, that's bare bones. Either. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, as opposed to like the Razer Core, which is five hundred dollars and gets you, it acts like a desktop dock, which is a yeah. much nicer product. Yes. But if you're just looking for a GPU, it's a bit excessive. So how how did we? What was the determination on how to test this? Right. Clearly, this picture here is us uh, <laughs> shows it connected to a, a ThinkPad laptop. Is it worth noting that this thing only comes with a one foot? Yeah, it yeah, comes with a short cable. It, that is the length that the cable it comes with. Yeah, it's which like is stupid. A, it's like a one meter cable, I would say. It's probably like a three foot cable. Okay. But I pretty much one had to have the laptop on top of the machine while testing it. Yeah. And someone asked in the chat, does it charge the laptop? It doesn't. It provides like 25 watts of juice to the machine, which isn't enough, especially if you're gaming. 
Yeah. So you have to make sure your laptop has either another Thunderbolt port for charging, which the X1 Carbon does, or has another power jack oh, like the XPS yeah, 13s do. Oh, yeah, I didn't think about do. that. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. So how did we go about testing it? So we, we looked at it. We wanted, I guess, we wanted to look at it in terms of how did it improve gaming performance? Yeah, so when I got this yeah. thing in the office, I did what any red-blooded PC enthusiast would, and I stuck a 1080 Ti in it, and I hooked it up to a laptop, and went, let's go. Yeah. And we started playing some games, and it and then, was stuttery. Oh. And we went, yeah. well, crap. Now we actually have to figure out why this is going on. Yeah, so if you look at this graph here, what you'll see is we, we connected the GPU dock to a desktop PC with Thunderbolt with the same 1080 Ti in it. Uh, and we used it with the 1080 Ti installed in the PC. So if you look at this, the orange line is with the 1080 Ti installed in the computer. And then that black the, mass. Uh, yeah, the black line is uh, the 1080 Ti in the Thunderbolt dock attached to it playing the game. That does which, not which is the most ridiculous setup in the world. Correct. We an X99 yeah. motherboard with a Thunderbolt 3 add-in card and no no GPU installed on the motherboard. Correct. And we're running our only GPU through Thunderbolt 3. Something so no the, one would was... ever do, but it eliminates CPU bottleneck. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So and what we saw here is even with there being no CPU bottleneck, there's still a big difference in the frame time variance um, between it being in a Thunderbolt 3 dock and being installed internally. Okay. Um, and that's, it's not insignificant, right? If we look at the 95th percentile or so, you grow up, you're looking at three and a half to three and three quarters of milliseconds of frame to frame variance, which is, which is a lot. It usually, it just kind of in my head, anything over three milliseconds is probably something you'll feel while you're playing the game. Yep. Uh, and we did. We did yeah. like notice this. It wasn't just like we we ran tests and saw it. We kind of noticed that it was stuttery. Um, and this is The Witcher Three showing in the same comparisons uh, a difference where the the frame time variance looks to be the same, right? And if you look here, it is, but the performance is noticeably lower. Instead of getting close to you know 175 frames per second internally, you're getting more like 120 frames per second through the external dock. So. There's definitely differences uh, between these systems. And Dirt Rally, the same thing. This so was actually interesting. Just to make things as confusing as possible, <laughs> Dirt Rally, uh, <laughs> you had a significant frame uh, frame rate difference where internally it was running at 190 frames per second. In the dock, it was running at like 125, 130 frames per second. But the frame variance was actually better on the dock than internally. What? Because yeah. dirt rally is just I, weird. I, I I can't I can't explain it. It was ex it was extremely repeatable. So now, it wasn't. Now that being said, it's very low. Either way, yeah. Ninety fifth percentile. We're at one point one milliseconds. Okay. In the, for the for the worst case. Um. So what what did you do next? What we you, we took the the uh we took the, the same, same desktop three results. configuration and okay. we tried it on a notebook. In this case, the Lenovo X1 Carbon 2017, which is a i5 7300U, I believe. It's a 15 watt dual core, hyper threaded part, typical ultrabook part. Essentially, in my mind, what I think of when I think of an ultra portable laptop, and what I think of when I think of the future of, hey, I can have this laptop and carry it around all day and it's thin and light, and I can come home and plug it into a GPU and play games. I don't have to have a dedica dedicated desktop rig. Yeah, makes sense. So. We did this. Uh, as an important note, there are different implementations for Thunderbolt 3 and laptops. Like Dell is seemingly notorious these days. Like all of their Thunderbolt 3 laptops connected by two instead of by four, which it's supposed mm. to be. So mm. we did verify the ThinkPad is connecting at by four. So it's 32 gigabits per second. It's PCIe 3. It was running at the intended bandwidth. So okay. having that out of the way, we took those results from the desktop on the 1080 Ti over Thunderbolt 3, and we compared them to the ThinkPad. So here's what we got. Ti. Hitman, 1080p, the frame rate dropped from about 110 to 60 frames per second, and frame variance went way up again. All right, so the orange, the orange mess is the ThinkPad with the external dock. The black is the desktop with the external dock. Yeah, so, I okay. mean, if you scroll up to the last set of results, you could look at what just a 1080 Ti is supposed to be in Hitman, like this orange. Yeah, that here. orange compared to scroll down the next orange isn't as 
is bad. Orders of magnitude. So yeah. Difference. yeah, no. Uh, 95th percentile, you're looking at almost 9 milliseconds of frame variance there through that. So clearly there is a there's a difference of, of Thunderbolt implementation and or uh, CPU utilization does matter a lot. Because keep in mind, these are dual core hyperthreaded processors in yeah. these notebooks yeah. or in this notebook, for example. Um, and you can see that, you know, the Witcher 3, which showed good frame variance in both instances up top, the 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 two the dual core setup clearly shows a lot of variance issues there, uh, as well as kind of a, a frame rate drop. And then in Dirt Rally, frame rates about the same, um, but more variance than we had before. I mean, Dirt well. Rally is also obviously the least GPU intensive game that we test anymore. Yes, so it's yeah. going it's likely going to show less of this. Yep. Variance. And then you also threw in an uh, an RX five seventy just to see. Right? Yeah, because my reasoning was I tried it with Nvidia and the experience was pretty solid. You just kind of I had to, I had to update the firmware on the dock, but that was kind of a manufacturing thing. I had to update that through their little Windows app for it to work with the just for it to work well with Windows. It was just on a different oh. Thunderbolt three firmware. But after that, I installed the GPU, the Nvidia GPU driver, and it just worked. It used the internal display of the laptop. Everything worked fine. Uh, we used an external display off the GPU for testing because we need to capture the video. Right. So we did that. And apparently using the internal display can lead to a little bit more latency, as you might expect, because it's sending the video back well, and we forth. Well, we did notice the same stuttering. Yes, we did notice stuttering. In the internal and external yeah. displays, yeah. which is worth noting, right? So Yeah. So I figured I'd test out AMD's implementation of this stuff, which they call X Connect in their driver. It actually has like a little tray yeah. thing where it pops up. You can it disconnect seemed- you more developed it does it than does the nvidia more. iteration and they were the ones pushing it when thunderbolt 3 was coming out in the yeah. razor core CES. Whereas nvidia was yeah. just like yeah, yeah we'll support that whereas amd was getting ahead of it they were the first one out. i think we saw demoing it yeah. it was at last season not no, not the most CS recent two cs ago, CSs ago. Yeah. yeah uh at their at their booth now we didn't put any comparisons in here because the 10 ati is not a good like it would not be a fair uh, a fair data point to put in there with it, but just to show that there, were, like, there were still variants in these games with the RX 570 running. Um, it looks pretty equivalent, you know, maybe a little bit less variance, would you say, on the 570 I, I, I versus say, ATI? I would say on a whole, it's a little better. Yeah. And another thing is like putting a 570 in this thing is way more reasonable than putting a 10 ATI in it. Assuming yeah. <laughs> you could buy a 570 new for 200 bucks or sure. 180 bucks, whatever it is, and not the crazy mining stuff, it would be way more reasonable to put a 570 in this thing than a $700 GPU. Yeah, I guess. Because then you're in a $1,000 hooking something up to your $1,500 notebook. I, I, you could have built a gaming PC sure. and had better performance. Sure. I, I do think the idea of, uh, of if this all worked swimmingly, that a 1080 Ti and a dock that is just like, that's your gaming machine, technically, if it worked well with your laptop and you didn't have frame variance issues and all that type of stuff. The question in the chat room is, uh, and I agree with this, do we think this is indicative of this dock or all docks? I don't think the dock is the issue. Because they're only a limited subset of Thunderbolt 3 controllers. I think there's like two or three of them. Okay. And we were using the one the, the node has the better of all of them, the most compatible, the one that works the best, the one that delivers full bandwidth. I think it's not indicative of all notebook experience, though. I think in reality, what you want is you want a true quad core mobile CPU, thin and light machine without a discrete GPU, which is kind of like a unicorn at this point right the machines you find with card core cpus these days generally have a 1050 a ti GPU or 1060 in them, yeah. in them. so yeah. you're, now, kind of, you're kind of searching for the magical laptop with good cooling a quad core gpu thunderbolt 3 quad core at, cpu yeah sorry quad core yeah. cpu thunderbolt 3 <laughs> with a by true by four connection to the cpu right and it's just not there yet. i tried to talk with nvidia a little bit about why we were seeing the 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 differences and you know the the PCIe bottleneck keeps coming up right as, as being a potential for if it. If it's only by four, then yeah, yeah. And and as you run at higher frame rates, it puts more pressure on that connection as well, which may lead to some more like back and forth. Not not throttling is not the word I'm looking for, but like, um, what do you call it? It catches up. 
and then slows back down, catches up and buffers and catches up and buffers. Oh. You know, I, I, I can't think of the term I'm, I'm, like a race I'm looking condition. for. Yeah, something like that where, you know, it gets to a point where it's, it's sending up too much data and then it's kind of waiting, gets into a wait state of some kind. Which and that's in maybe the end, why we see this which frame Which in the end variance. just gives you a judder. Yeah, yeah. right. Which is, which, is what, which is what we see. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting, nonetheless. We are we're getting at least one more of these in, I believe. No, that was a normal Thunderbolt three dock, not yeah. a GPU dock. No. So, and we, also, it's not like this is such a common configuration that Nvidia is like heavily optimizing for. No, but they should. I mean, some of their bit like Razer sells a product that does this. Sure. Razer yeah. laptops with their external mm -hmm. thing, and Dell sells one. Well, yeah. uh, Dell's anyway. is their proprietary connection, not Thunderbolt three. It's got to be PCIe. Well, they're though, abandoning right? that and going uh, with USB 3.1 now. Like they're well, they're dumping the docks from the product three point one. You wouldn't use USB 3.1. Yeah. It would have to be Thunderbolt yeah. 3. But oh, I mean, yeah. Thunderbolt sells 3, one of these. Yeah. Power Color sells one of these. Like there are a lot of traditional laptop manufacturers, not traditional, like traditional vendors in the space we would mm -hmm. usually recognize. Like component selling these. vendors. It, Kitio or whatever is just kind of the cheapest one, and and they make a good product. They really do. Like, yeah, they they make the bare bones product that has the best stuff in it, and you know, just works for a reasonable price. Uh, not Swinger asks in the chat, we'd recommend it for VR, and absolutely not. Like, no. frame variance is the worst thing you can have for a VR, yeah. a, a good quality VR experience. I mean, unless so you done. ate something and you really need to get rid of it quickly, <laughs> right? In which case, totally go for it. Right. But other than that, no. It, yeah. it would be great for compute. If you had some reason to do that, like if you were, yeah. if you were yeah. doing, I don't even know, something at home that required compute, <laughs> you could just plug in a <laughs> GPU and it would work completely fine. Yeah. My machine learning tasks. I did Bitcoin mine a little bit with it, and or not Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum mine for a little bit with it, and it was fine. Yeah, that's I, mean, true. I would hope that would work. I would yeah. hope that would work over. Certain people use buy one, buy essentially one. just like yeah. bailing wire to connect GPUs to machines yeah. for mining. Pretty much yeah. like Ethernet cable, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, before we get to our next story, uh, we have two new patrons. We have Sean House, H E U S. He's Hess. Hoos. House. Yeah. I'm sure we covered Sorry, it. Sorry, Sean. We've got one of those counts. He pledged five ninety nine. Thank Gosh. you very much, Sean. Thank you. Thank $5 you. Five ninety nine. Uh, and David. Thank you. David pledged five dollars as well. So thank Sweet. you both mm -hmm. to Sean and David. Thank you very much for that. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, Maury posted a review of the Gigabyte X29 Aorus Gaming 3 motherboard. And despite the fact that it's a Gaming 3, which would kind of kind of out of the box tell me this is like a low-end product, they still look like this. There's still LED lights. There's still uh, metal uh, reinforcement on the PCIe slots and on the DIMM slots and that type of stuff. Metal still, reinforcement still, on the DIMM slots now? I mean, I think it just yeah. looks cool. Yeah. I mean, it looks cool, mm -hmm. except the dims cover up. If you the really pull on that memory module without undoing the hooks, you don't want yeah, the. Yeah, but maybe you don't have all out. the dims in. I, I guess. You know, I don't think I've ever seen them. anybody rip a dim slot off of a motherboard. I, yeah, I don't think I've ever I, seen I did. Oh, Give him time, Al. Oh, You'll see one eventually. Okay. Wait, Josh, did you say you did? I, yeah, I, I broke a <laughs> dim slot once, yeah. and a metal reinforcement would have stopped that. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> Wait, was it there? You go. Was it Gigabyte or MSI that did the SMT dim slots at some point? Oh, um, they, had, they had service. Oh. I don't slots. remember who that was, but yeah, but yeah, it looked awesome from the back of the board. It did because didn't it was, have the. There's no one of the solder stuff. points yeah. through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That probably is the easiest way to get them ripped off of the board, though. <laughs> yeah. Right. True. The least amount of support possible. Yeah. Uh, so this is, in terms of X299 boards, this is kind of on the lower end version of that at like 260 bucks or so. <laughs> the lower end. I mean, and just mm. just put, you know, I'm just saying like it is. <clears throat> but it's obviously, you know, the new LGA 2066 chipset for the, uh, Skylake X processors. Does it have the insane chart that says if you use the this CPU, you... Yeah, that you, was a gigabyte chart, yes, actually. Yes, that would apply, yeah, like, that would apply These here. DIMM slots stop working, these PCIe slots stop working. Yep. Like, uh, okay. Yep. RGB Fusion is in here. You got smart fans. Uh, not very much. Uh, this is part of the gaming three versus the five or seven. Yeah. Um, not a whole lot of connectivity in the back. You it's still got have, audio. It's all you need. It's got audio. It's got <laughs> like, analog audio. It's fine. It's got like, Ethernet. Like what, it's got audio. It's what got some more USBs. Do you need than that? It's got I a mean, PS2 port. It's I mean, got a red USB port. Literally, what does that mean? USB 3.1. What's, what's the, oh, red is USB? I thought pink was USB 3.1. Depends on who you are. Or light blue. Pink. Who no. uses pink? It's, or it's light, light blue. blue. It's light blue. It's light blue. But this is that red is, is like a charging port, probably. Oh, uh, really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
So it's got 10 USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports. Eh. Uh, one USB Type-C right? port on the back with USB 3.1 Gen 2 support and one USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-A red on the back um, for that. Oh. Uh, and then uh, the Ethernet is Intel uh, Gigabit yeah. LAN. So there he goes for that. Um, overall, a, a pretty good board. Uh, Mori is still kind of ramping up on the whole X299 platform in terms of like what are the expectations, what are your overclocking capabilities, uh, those types of things. Obviously, there's a lot of discussion going on about on these boards in terms of um, VRMs and heat. VRMs mm -hmm. and heat and all that type of stuff. Mori didn't run into any particular issues here. Uh, but it's it's definitely a concern for those who are doing kind of the super high end uh, overclocking. There's that, and there's things. apparently still a lot of like rushed, uh, you know, manufacturers rushing the boards out, not necessarily mapping all the options correctly. And yeah, the BIOS configurations. Of, we've definitely seen multiple, you know, Gigabyte BIOSes, multiple MSI BIOSes, and ASUS BIOSes come through yeah. all of our all of our testing. Um, so yeah, this is actually gives you an idea here of. There are five PCIe slots on this board, I-16 size, Yep. right? Physical size. Okay. Depending on the processor, here is your breakdown. Oh, boy. Right? I'm not going to read it, but 44-lane processor, the highest-end processors, the 10-core, um, you're going to get I-16 slots, 1, 3, and 5 support full by 16 by 16 or uh, by 16 by 16, 8. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then slot two supports a by four maximum. And then you go down the 16 lane processor where one and three support by 16 or by 16 uh, by four. By four. And then, and then slot two works. and five are disabled. <laughs> All right. Right. Well, this is, the, this is the kind of thing with I don't know if this is an option and maybe it's, it's even on this particular board, but when you install your processor and you turn it on, LED lights need to come on next to the slots that you can populate. <laughs> yeah, let's just put it on yeah. the silk screen. It's the. The freaking slot should glow. Yeah. Like they should use like before a, you turn a, the system on, but when you power it. Like you, like you, you flip it on the you turn on your the power switch. supply. Yeah, yeah, before you hit the power so button. So usually when it's you have the power button and the other so stuff light see. up. Yeah. Yeah, like there should just be running lights <laughs> along all the slots. I mean it supports you know. LEDs, so I mean there's you know, LED strips. There's something to that. But um, check out Maury's review slash preview. He goes over benchmarks and, and we still do some overclocking. Let's see, what did he get this up to? Four point seven gigahertz uh, with a three gigahertz uh, mesh bus and three gigahertz memory speed oh, at one point two six volts. Mesh bus, another Yet another number. It's between. like the QPI speed you know it, or, yeah. or whatever you. What, what was it called on, on Broadwell E? Um, does like it was like the bus. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. F FSB, not FSB. No, FSB's been gone oh, for a ring. long time. I mean, people are still calling it FSB though. Unfortunately, <laughs> no, they're not. No, no. Just I, trust me. I wish we still had frontside bus. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I want to go and jumpers. It's just the clock and jumpers. Uh, Two hundred seventy nine dollars at Newegg. Um, Goods are stock performance, overclocking potential, the price in terms of for X299 platforms at least. Uh, two RGBW headers, by the Ooh. way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, weaknesses, uh, CMOS battery placement. Lack of third, you know, so it only has two M.2 ports, probably fine. Um, so SATA ports 4, 5, 6, and 7 are disabled with M.2 drive seated in the second port. Right, so it's just... Turns off four of them? Yeah, that's what he says. So there's four still available, and four by adding a single M.2. M.2. Yeah, it's not the usual ratio that that follows, but okay. Yeah, usually it kills a two pair. Port, two SATA. Yeah. Well, so it might it might not have to, but they might kill all of them because they figure they tell you that's the slot to populate second. Yeah. So maybe they have all like all of the impetus on that one. If you do dual. Yeah, but it should only have to take away two status. Sure, point. but it had to take right. away two status for each, right? No. Okay. For each M.2? Never mind then. No, no, no. A one would be inherent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. like one SATA is like a pair of PCIe lanes. So M.2 is by four. Yes. So. Pair of SATA. Gotcha. Two SATAs. So check that out. That's the uh, X Gigabyte X299 Aorus Gaming 3 motherboard preview slash review from Mori. Uh, so uh, just yeah. you know, kind of curious. Um, we missed something on the rundown. What, what's the, the, the VRM situation on X299 stuff that we've been hearing a lot about? So, I mean, it's, not, we so it's not great. Have we talked about that at all? 
Uh, we haven't really. I, I've I've only done uh, reading on it myself. No, no real hands on uh, with it. The issue stems around um, higher power draw with Skylake X than we saw with Broadwell E and motherboard vendors either not having enough time to understand that and develop products accordingly or underdeveloping products or, or Intel or, not giving the right recommendations to motherboard vendors for, or, for this type of stuff. Or at least in one case, it was like their options, like the BIOS level configuration for the CPU was like messed up to the point where it would turbo all of the cores to the, to the, uh, yeah, you know, there's the, some of that like turbo all the cores to what would normally be the one or two core yeah. turbo number. And it would jack up the voltage levels to correspond to like the, you know, to make it work. And then you're drawing more power, like way yep. higher TDP than the processors. And, and, are rated and at. we saw this in my overclocking testing, though I didn't equate it to VRMs and didn't look at those temperatures specifically. Honestly, uh, when when I was hitting like over 100 C spikes yeah. on my overclocks, yeah, I was like, but mm. if the VRMs were getting really hot, that would. I mean, they're going to get hot because yeah. if you're drawing enough yeah. power to, you know, VRMs are just going to get hot just, yeah. because of the power draw. It's not that the VRMs are necessarily even different from the previous generation. Right, they could be the same exact parts, but might they need to be beefier they for might, if you're drawing this much beefier. more power? Yeah. power. And, yeah. and like, if you look at it, I think it has to follow on sort of Intel's recommendations for I would laying out these boards because if you look at multiple manufacturers, they're all kind of having the same problems. Yeah, yeah. yeah. either it's not high enough quality components, or it's like the heat sinks over the VRM being mostly decorative because we haven't had to really worry about this in yeah, a while. That's so a, they've that's gotten a, bigger... a little lax on. Like actually making yeah. full contact that's pipes a bigger one. or VRMs and stuff, but yeah. a lot of people seem to be doing it. Just about everyone, as it turns out, right? If not everyone, so it seems like it probably has to fall on Intel if everyone is doing it. Yep. Um. Yes. So that's that's kind of the state it's in now. I. I. You know. I still need to demand a better answer from Intel on. Why is the TP so high? Why is Why is it drawing so much power when the TDP is is not listing that? Right. Right. And that's because that may be the fundamental issue is if you give all the documentation to motherboard vendors that say it's the power draw is essentially the same or 20 watts within 20 watts of our previous generation, but you actually are doing 75 to 100 watts more. Yeah. You might that quote up the unquote, margin. <laughs> underdevelop your motherboard power delivery yeah. <laughs> uh, situation some. So um, you don't want to overbuild when it costs you money and you don't need to. Correct. Correct. Or you shouldn't mm -hmm. have to overbuild by case. that much. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Uh, before we switch to the next story, there was one missing for the rundown. We'll just it'll be real quick. Ken, RX four seventy mining edition. It's an RX four seventy with one DVI port. Moving on. Yeah, basically. <laughs> okay. And everything a warranty. Uh, everything is the same, right? Yeah, and, and a ninety day warranty. I think it was ninety. Ninety or one eighty, I forget yeah. which one. I think it was, it was ninety. Yeah. But it did hash at a higher rate than yeah. the other four seventy? It hashed That's today. because it had a different memory system. Because it was a factory overclock card versus uh, reference card. Okay. And it had a different memory vendor. It did was it, Samsung. It drew less high power? Yes. No. Uh, well yeah. no, no, no. So like it did. you can you can get the Two other cards so. with Samsung memory on them. It's just a lottery. Sure. Right. But this so, did draw 10 watts less power out of the box. Yeah, There's but, something but to if that. you if you applied an undervolt to both of them, they perform the same. Yeah. Well, okay. it, the, the, you saw the hash rate difference, but the power draw, the power was, draw the was the same. Yeah. yeah. So don't buy any of these cards for mining because... I mean, just probably don't buy cards for mining. That shit's busting. Yeah. All right. Anyway... <laughs> Moving on. Uh, the real interesting story of the week is 10 gigabit Ethernet. Everybody needs it. Everybody wants it. Yeah, yeah. We have we have these cards here. We actually bought these. Um, this is the Asus XG C100C NIC. Um, this is what it looks Cute like. little cards. It's just a, uh, a PCIe by one. Is that by one? That's a by four. By four. Oh, by four. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Add-in card that does 10 gigabit Ethernet. Now... Obviously, having one of these is not very useful, <laughs> um, but it does support. It does, you know, support gigabit. So if you buy one of these and put it in your system, it will still work with all of your gigabit switches and PCs and all that. And two and a half and five gigabit, which are the new standards. Right. Do they come with the other bracket? Yes. The half height. The only th only other thing that comes in the box is the low profile bracket. Okay. Cool. Now, what was what was interesting about this, Ken, was like installation was easy, right? 
Yeah. Uh, so it's a Nick. <laughs> but no, I mean the driver. Like you didn't. Windows had the driver in it. Yeah. So both the machines oh. I tested were CPU test beds that we had updated cr- to creators on Windows 10. So I'm not exactly sure what when, the right. what the wide array of support for this is, but yeah. it automatically pulled the driver. I don't know if it pulled it from Windows Update or if it had it in the installer because they were both connected to the regular sure. network. Yeah. At that point, but absolutely pulled the correct driver wasn't even just like an inbox driver that that happened to work it was the correct driver it was the asus driver was, well yeah. it was the quantia driver oh, okay okay yeah, yeah which is just an inf file so like no app to go along with it no killer style app to and, and no no kernel background. driver from the sounds of it if it's just an inf i don't remember if there's a sys or not but I'm, I'm it looking. was just a simple driver package exactly like you would want let's see windows 10 64-bit driver driver package uh what are you looking at? Um, so we bought two of them, put them in two PCs, mm-hmm. connected them with an Ethernet cable. With just a run-of-the-mill Cat5E. Well, Cat5E. Yeah, Cat5E Cat Cat cable that we, that we made four years ago. Yeah. That yeah. is pretty long. It's like a 30-foot cable. Right. Home Depot Cat5E. <laughs> and it linked at 9.45 gigabits per second. That's pretty close to ten. The, dri- the driver looks like it has more language crap in it than uh, the than driver. actual driver. Yeah, <laughs> usually. Yeah, INF is twelve lines. Language package it's, twelve it's, megs. It's like a six meg download. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is so you know you're getting uh, uh, nine and a half gigabits per second. Which uh, if I do my math right, <laughs> and by that I mean open up my calculator uh, divided by eight, you're like one point one gigabytes per second. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 1,100 megabytes per second. So, you know, way faster than most systems can go. Like storage, you know, your your even your your you know yeah, your you SAT, a, any SATA SSD is going to be like five six hundred megs per second. Yep. So you can Which saturate that, that with this, right? Well, it's half. But if you go to PCIe yeah, SSD and you want to transfer something megs. off of it, yeah, it's a lot better than uh, standard gigabit. I would rather waste yeah. the headroom at the high end oh, sure. than be oh sure just kneecapped 200 this, megs if yeah. you if you move stuff around on a network which we do a lot. often large here, files a lot large files yeah you know you think gigabit is fast when you it's gigabit's fast when that's your internet connection when we got gigabit <laughs> fiber it was like holy crap this is amazing but then our testing we generate a 26 gigabyte file every 60 seconds yeah. and we want to copy that off to another location so we don't have to keep it on that machine at 110 megs per second, that takes a long time per file. It does. Now, if we can do a gig per second by buying two of these cards, how much are these, Ken? These, like, what, 100 they're bucks? They're MSRP for 100. They're going a little over it right now because they're just starting to get in the yeah. channel. So this is the Cheaper type of thing. Fiber. And And switches are expensive right now, right, still? Yeah. I mean, a switch is like $100 a port. So for like an A-port switch, it's like seven or $800 at this point. Yeah. Netgear Pro Safe are the... Small business ones that seem to be the cheapest. Yeah, they have an there's, port there's, for like seven hundred. There's an ASUS switch that has the two ten gig ports and six one gig ports, I believe. Okay. So if you only need two of these, like you had a file server in your desktop and you just want to be able to transfer fast between those, right? But you know the crap on your network that didn't need to be so fast, right? You could do that as an option. And a Quantia who makes these network controllers, the cheap ones that are starting to get into the market from ASUS, a Quantia sells these cards themselves for like one thirty. Gigabyte has announced them. I expect these to be all over the place at some point. It's probably bundled in with motherboards too. I even think though. there's an X370 motherboard with it on board. There's like a, there, there's supposedly like switches Aris maybe. Supposedly switches yes, coming. And in. at Computex, Aquanti announced they're working with Switch people to get it down to about thirty to forty dollars a port on a Switch. Yeah. And and I you know I would say if people you know prosumer type people that maybe do large video editing or whatever and they were trying to back up to a network device or something like that. Uh, or uh, a different system. This is something where, if if that's important to you, spending two hundred bucks on two NICs and creating their own private network yeah. for just that purpose yeah. would be really beneficial. Like that's what, what, that's what we're how we did all her testing. Like yeah, I mean you just you have to self assign the IPs in Windows. Yeah, like yeah, the good old days with like a crossover cable. But yeah, yeah, you just do that and it works fine. Yeah, so it's, to me this is this is probably the most you know. Now storage is the storage is answered. Like we know how to do storage now. We fast NVMe storage. We're done. Like this is the next step. Is how do you get at a consumer price point 
that fast of data outside of your machine. Mm -hmm. Thunderbolt could have been it, but it's still very pricey, and the, the number of accessories are quite yeah. minimal. And, and as of Thunderbolt 3, you can do 10 gig networking over a Thunderbolt cable. Yeah. Which is and, interesting. And so thing, even... Uh, so, uh, if switches become less expensive, then suddenly Thunderbolt to 10 gigi adapters make a lot of sense as no, well. You, you could do Thunderbolt 3 to Thunderbolt 3 on two PCs. Right, right. That's process. about for like, like more sure, machines sure. on the same yeah. network. Yeah. And when you switch, and when you switch from gigabit to 10 gig, you start to be able to change your mentality on some other stuff too. Like it gets to the point where you can actually scrub timelines of a video that's from across the network. Right. Like you know, you can do yeah. things that are like the, where the latency. Storage. Yeah, yeah, where normally you would have to, oh, let me copy that over from the NAS to my local machine so I can do Maybe this Maybe I'll edit. just run this installer instead of copying it. Yeah, yeah, so, that too. I, like, I mean, you know. and another example is that machine over there we do our video capture on, we, we, we'll, we'll create 800 gigs of data in an afternoon. Yeah. And normally what we do is we transcode it on that machine, which is only a quad-core machine. That's a different discussion. <laughs> Right, it's like an overnight transcode. Well, yeah, it's, it's a couple of hours yeah. probably yeah. to do the whole thing, and then we copy the files off to the network server. What we would do now is we would put a ten gig card in there, and you know whatever the network server's on, copy that nine hundred gigs over, and yeah. then have that machine do the transcode. So this machine's not hold, held up from doing further testing while yeah. the compression is occurring. Right, so and we haven't and we haven't tested it, but potentially maybe. You could just do the the stream and like record the recording straight across the network. Might work. Ten gig. Maybe. You might have enough to do that. It might. Maybe. Might work. A single frame it. drop would be bad. That's true. That's, yeah. that's we, the we issue. are very sensitive to frame yeah. drops on okay. the, yeah. the frame rate. As, as an additional thing, uh, just to make sure it wasn't like these Aquantia stuff nicks aren't just kind of weird and funky. We actually tested it to an Intel X550, their 10 gig NIC that's oh. on the X99 EWS board. Yeah. Worked fine. Same speed. Same exact speed. Compatibility. So this to an, an Intel 10 yes. gig E controller, so same It issues, seems like all this will be interoperable between any equipment you might possibly have, which I don't think you will, but if you're in an office environment, well, maybe there's partial 10 gig, 10 gig stuff. You can put some of these Aquantia NIC cards in your machines. It'd be fine. And yes, we know you can get used 10 gig NICs off eBay or less than this that might have SFP connectors, might have RJ45s on them. You can get SFP for cheaper, sure. Yeah, I bought a thirty gig or thirty dollar Mellanox SFP ten gig card to put in our file server because right. it's a very short run. We have a pro safe switch with an SFP port on it. It makes sense. Thirty bucks had the cable from doing our AD testing. Right, absolutely great solution. But if you're looking for RJ45, hundred bucks for a new product that didn't come out of some server. Is pretty damn good. Yeah. So you're supposed to be able to go 55 meters over Cat 6. Mm-hmm. That's pretty far. Yeah. Uh, and, like, you're supposed to also be able to use, like, Cat 5 E. Well, we did. At a, at a, yeah, low, at a lower e length. Yeah, Cat 5 E At a shorter length. Sure. Slightly, but it's yeah. not but if that anything, much shorter. And less bends. If I've learned Cat anything about... more forgiving to bends. Yeah. If I've learned anything about Ethernet standards is that they are way under-promising. Oh, Yeah. If you can run a <laughs> 600 foot, how far was, was it? Was it 600 feet? I think it, it was, was a about that. We took a 500 foot spool and crimped two ends on it. Okay, so yeah. we took a 500 yeah. foot Cat 5e yeah. and ran. Ran it between megabit. two buildings. Yeah. yeah, in the winter. And it worked perfectly <laughs> across outside. the grass. Outside. The lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> a lawnmower clipped it in the middle somewhere. It did, but did not sever the important and it wires. It still worked. I have that. It, I have it that, I, the cable. We, we cut yeah. that ca that part of the cable out of it, and we have it somewhere still. I think. Yeah. So now we have like two 200 foot cables. Yes. <laughs> Actually, to be honest, that might have been what I used. Oh, was one of those, half of that cable. Half of that cable? Or at least a portion the net, of that cable. That's probably so, 100 feet. Though. It was at least Actually, I think cable it was great. from that same spool. I think that one was great. Maybe. Yeah, it, it was great. Yeah, that was great yeah. cable. Yeah. But Ken used you a know, pretty, this is, pretty long length to connect yeah. those it's two. It's probably like 30 feet, if I had to guess. I, it probably it, I, it was. It was coiled up, Ethan. Like, not good testing circumstances for the Ethernet cable. That's true. And a big inductor he used to test this. It's like, eh, whatever. If it goes fast the first time, it's fine. Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. So this is really reminiscent of, of one of the last kind of previous big jumps in, in networking technology. And that was, you know, 10100 hubs got to be pretty affordable. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you can get a five port for 150 bucks. But in like 1999 is when the first switch chips came out that were really affordable. Like you can get an eight port 10100 switch for 220 bucks. And that was considered 
absolutely unheard of. Yeah. And I remember testing that and, and the networking performance was night and day. If you had like three or four computers on a hub versus, Oh yeah. You know, on a switch. Yeah. And plus I used to work in a hospital where they had all these hubs and we just called the, cl- the, the, the closet they're in the collision zone because, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was just pointless. But yeah, I mean this, it's really kind of exciting because when we went from hubs to switches and 10, 100, I mean, that was, that was just such a huge jump in usability and reliability and all that. And now we're starting to get to the 10 G stuff. That's fine. 30 bucks a port. It's nice. It's, yeah. it's, I mean, 10 gig over copper RJ. Well, maybe not RJ 45, 10 gig over copper has been around since 2007. Yeah. It yeah. seems crazy that it's taken this long. And another thing that's interesting. Like, I understand it, but it's just, it sucks. Another thing that's interesting, but it might not apply until these alternate chips start getting into more things like the switches and whatnot. But like the, if you get one of those Intel NICs or the SFP stuff or whatever, like the failover, the fallback is one gigabit. Yeah. Or lower, right? This has a five gigabit and, 2. 5. and a 2.5 gigabit fallback. So if you like buy a new router that might support 2.5 in a year yeah. right. and doesn't support the full 10 because that will still be more expensive. I mean, you're throwing, away, you're throwing away some of the bandwidth this could do, but at least, you know, it would yeah. work. The The Intel NIC connected to that would just fall back to one gigabit. Gotcha. It doesn't yeah. have any yeah. in between. So, so that's the reason to buy this newer stuff as opposed to some of the, some older, the older stuff on eBay. Stuff. Yeah. 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 Uh, so that's the Asus XG C100C. We're just really a bad model name. Yeah, C100C. I don't understand. Because it's not 100 gigabit. Yeah, I no. And, and I first thought that, <laughs> at first it was typing it as the XC like 10G I think, which would have been a great model name. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but no, no. And it's, then if you add in Roman numerals with C100C, <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah. redundant. 100, yeah. 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100. Nice, nice. Yeah. Uh, what else we got on here? Uh, let's see. Some VR stuff. Very quick here. The you could now get. I don't know how long this is going to last. It's a, they call it a short-term price reduction, but for three hundred ninety-nine bucks, you can now get an Oculus Rift and touch controllers. I think they they said it was the summer. I think they clarified for the next six weeks. Okay, that is two hundred. That's, that's two hundred bucks less than it used to be, right? Yeah, it was five ninety-nine for the yeah, combo. How many how many sensors does it come with? Uh, I assume just two. Okay, but it has to be at least two to support the controllers. Yeah, you get your two controllers. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that extra sensor is a hundred bucks. I think. So I think that's right. You mean if you wanted a third, you want a third yeah. one? Yeah. Well, you don't really. You don't need it. I mean, you really don't. I Unless mean, you need to spin around on a chair, face the other way, and just get that cord totally tangled up on the mm-hmm. bottom. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, don't do that. Um, so I, I realize like VR's uptick has been significantly slower than a lot of people wanted and expected, but for three ninety nine is really impressive. That's a really good for, deal. Well, how about because the headset by itself was five ninety nine at one point, right when it first launched? Yeah. And Vive then, is still eight hundred bucks. The Vive is still eight hundred dollars, yeah. seven ninety nine. Yeah, uh, I think they run like a hundred dollars special at some point. I think Amazon was okay. Um, I actually, during Prime Day, you could get this Oculus package with a hundred dollars Amazon gift card. Yeah. So now I will say, bucks. like the Vive is probably still my preferred platform for it, but I actually like the I like the headset. The better. headset of the Rift is better. The tracking on the yeah. Vive is better than Oculus. Yes. But. And and the and the controller the design of the controllers I like better for touch on the Oculus. On yeah. the Oculus than on the Vive, but the Vive has better tracking again. Yeah. Like the the optical tracking yeah, you're back to that. is 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 much better than the camera tracking. But still very usable and like very fun and playable and and there's a lot whole lot of title overlap and everything for that regard. So for 399, if you have a VR ready PC, it's a Pretty and I mean a, a VR ready PC these days is like they they qualified the 960 at some point right yeah with the uh, AC yeah. space warp stuff yeah. so like you might have a VR ready PC and not realize it yeah hopefully you don't have to buy a GPU yeah that's a bad time if, <laughs> if GPUs are at MSRP you could buy this and a PC <laughs> yeah. for less than a thousand dollars to do VR yeah I which think is so. way better than the fifteen hundred dollars yeah. it was when that crap came out yeah uh, and then also. Um, Scott wanted us to point out that the Razer HDK2 is three ninety nine as well, and apparently, if you prove you're a student, uh, yeah, if you or got developer. some sort of a educational or your developer, right, you get an extra twenty percent off, 
And if you are involved in, let's like say, a university or a school, you can email them for a two-for-one promotion, <laughs> which is kind of damn cool. I just don't know enough about this one to tell anybody to buy it. I've, yeah. It's, it still has it's the term. It's a developer kit. It, we'll still has, it, it still has the term DK2 in it, which bothers me a whole <laughs> lot because the DK2 is drastically outdated compared to the Rift and the Vive. Right. And this, doesn't come this one's also playing with new uh, protocols like OpenXR and a couple of other things that we haven't seen really yet. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't so really it's know. All, it's very much a dev kit. Yeah. yeah. I, no controllers. Yeah. I don't, it's, yeah. It's, it's literally a dev kit. I, I would definitely not yeah. recommend this for a consumer looking to play VR games. Yeah. Definitely not that. But if you want to learn how to program them and you're Maybe. going to school yeah. for it, drop yeah. them an email. It's true. It can't hurt. Get two for one. Yeah. And then use them a lot? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Sebastian posted this up. Uh, Jeremy, what was the summary of uh, the original story and then the response from Intel? Well, I mean, see, the thing is that this Pentium G4560 was quite popular. It was cheap. Uh, what was it, about 60 bucks, 70 bucks? Yeah, I think it was closer to 90, well. maybe, but yeah. Yeah. It overclocked well, and a lot of people who are gaming on a budget pick the damn thing up because, hey, who cares if it's a Pentium or not? It works. You got four threads. I can't honestly remember what the frequency for this guy was, but it was... It was like around three. Respectable. It's like 3.2 or something, I thought. Yeah, and you could probably hit close to four with it if you put a lot of effort into it. So... Essentially, they're just, it, it was cannibalizing, or at least this is the theory that a lot of us support, is that it was cannibalizing a lot of Core i3 sales, which were slightly more expensive, and in some cases, uh, nowhere near as good uh, at gaming sure. once you overclock it, because the Core i3 has some extra features in it, which a basic gamer is never going to touch. They don't care, they don't need it, and... Those extra features cost an extra couple of bucks, so you're looking at eighty bucks, a hundred bucks. So it kind of makes sense that yeah, you you kill off the forty five sixty because it, it's selling too well. But Intel uh, is saying that well, no, uh, we're we're continuing to offer this. It's just that the demand fluctuation is such that it's disappearing off the market. So it looks like we're not making it. What it is is that just so many have been bought that you can't get one. It's almost like a bunch of people recently were building PCs with the cheapest possible plat processor they could find <laughs> for a good They one. didn't need processing mm. power. They needed GPU power. Weird. And this was a really cheap way to get a system set up. That doesn't seem very so, likely, though. So what other yeah. answer could there be? Yeah. Um, you know, Blame the miners. So I would say this. So the, in, like Intel, when they build a part like the 4560, they know that it's going to cannibalize something like Core i3 sales to the DIY consumer, they just don't give a shit, right? Nope. The it, core, it they get the money in the end, right? The, to... the Core i3 is for, like, the business budget user, right? Yeah. For Dell and HP. Yeah, and, and this is for, hey, stop buying those Athlons <laughs> and buy this instead, Right, so they they know that they're kind of undercutting that market, but they're willing to do it because they realize this is this is not targeting an audience that's like oh, I'm going to buy a Core i7, but wait, here's a Pentium 4560. Yeah, this is the I have 80 bucks. Yep, yeah. I'm going to buy the best part for 80 bucks. If you don't make it, I'm going to buy that Athlon. It's right? True. And so it, it it makes sense to me that that this is actually just a quote normal demand fluctuation. Um, that, that Intel used uh, in, in kind of referencing the story that Sebastian wrote. But um, of course, if they cranked out a whole bunch more of them, there wouldn't be a supply problem, would there? It takes a long time. You don't just, you don't it's true. just pop, pop a yeah. sticker on that. And, baby. and if they followed that, they'd be making crap tons of Celerons right now because the low end Celerons <laughs> for this platform also sold out. So for similar reasons. So they just have their entire inventory at Microsoft would just be Celerons. Uh, and finally, sadly, not a NAND gate, 
even if some of these RAM rumors were false, we are in for shortages. And I know Jeremy wrote this without looking at the t- uh, without looking at the uh, author <laughs> field because rumors is spelled with a U after the O, mm. as it should be. No, well, like we colors. Can, colors. Yes, the rumors are false. The rumors uh, sounds more French than English. Well, sure. Um, <laughs> what are we looking at here? What's what's what, why do we have a wafer picture uh, here? Well, because we may or may not have seen 60,000 wafer starts die. It's like a million uh, tiny silicon voices all yes, cried out. Silence silenced Ad- forever. Yeah. So there's a couple of places like DRAM Exchange, which, you know, keeps a very close eye on RAM supplies and just NAND market in general, reporting that there was an incident in a micron plant, uh, the Tyun Fab in uh, South Korea where a bunch of nitrogen was released and killed off about 5.5% of what was currently on the line being produced. And it re- resulted in an evacuation of the plant. <laughs> Micron I mean, has come funny. back to say, well, there was an incident. No dyes were harmed in the making of this incident, and we didn't have to <laughs> evacuate our factory. So it's quite possible that rumors of the death were greatly exaggerated. But on the other hand... Uh, we're looking at a huge NAND shortage right now. Uh, Samsung is tooling up a, a bunch of stuff with its new technology, but it's going to be years before those fabs are, you know, fully going at 100%. Yeah. Uh, and SK Hynix and Toshiba, well, you know, they're already booked at 100%. They're arguing about it, who's going to buy them. Yeah, we, at this point, there's a very interesting argument about, uh, well, we've kept trying to buy you. I think it's six times now, and people <laughs> don't want it to happen, but it's going to happen. <laughs> just just, just accept it. Uh, grab those ankles, and away you go. So even like a 5.5% hit on the, the supply of NAND uh, in the next couple of months is going to have a huge impact on yeah. prices that are already continuing to go up because you, you simply can't ship a product with 95% of the storage you intended. Oh, you can. It's an all or nothing thing. <laughs> it's well, called <laughs> over-provisioning. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, uh, Jeremy, does this the help? the wafer's dead, the wafer's dead. Jeremy, does this help or hurt the 10 cent per gigabyte directive? <laughs> it, it's a not good for Ryan's law. It is, mm-hmm. is even at the best where Micron says, hey, we did have a little bit of an incident. Well, if you were shut down for even a little bit, Ryan's 10 cent law is is getting pushed back a little bit further. I, I mean, Josh can correct me on this, but if they have to shut down the line, you're wrong. And, <laughs> <laughs> they have to shut down a line in a fab for any reason. Restarting it takes a significant amount of time. Like we're talking yeah. days or weeks, right? restart yeah, a line on they a fab had to, they had to purge the the whole nitrogen system and that's and everything that they threw through there they had to just obviously as they mentioned you got to chuck because yeah anything that was in the doped line up with stuff that you don't want in chips i hate when i'm all doped up i know oh you eat some chips and you get the bends it's awful <laughs> exactly you don't want that nitrogen and I guess that sometimes, if it depends on the wafer and where it's at, um, if you don't go to the next step in a certain amount of time, you're you're looking to throw those away as well. So it's uh, it's a big deal. So glad I bought my and it's SSD. It's all because of oxidation. A couple weeks ago. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's get into our hardware software picks of the week. I waited to the last possible moment to select. Nope. Uh, wait, what, ha- what the hell happened? What? What? Who? What? There it is. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> Next. I'm pick. so surprised. Shocking. I, have, I don't know if you guys have heard about this. This is the ASUS XG C100C. It's a 10 gigabyte Ethernet. 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100. It's a PCIe by four card. It's a single RJ45 okay, port. Stop talking. It's got right, a hyper just, fast just, gigabit already, per second it's, networking. It's, yeah. Okay. It delivers, quote, up to 10x faster data transfer speeds. Ryan's for pick of the week. The thing on the desk in front of him. Demanding yes. tasks. Okay. Yep. Got it. Um, Two of them. Yes. There's it the does support one. 100 megabit fallback. I got to ask, you know, yeah. did you discuss how hot that gets? I, you know, I, I, I kind of missed that. I was zoning out. I don't know. You know, I because didn't. Networking. It has a pretty I, beefy heat sink. I didn't take it any measurements or anything. Uh, 
I don't know. I did some sustain testing on it and didn't really see. I mean, ten any gig. Issues. You know, it'll get warm, but I, I yeah. mean, I think ten gig parts like the earlier ones it's were drawn like, like people 10 have watts. like laser thermometers to yeah. measure heat. Well, well, hey, we can have a flare. So there. Interesting side note. We got successive, or what do you, it's not successive, what do sequential. you, sequential, sequential serial no. number and MAC addresses yep. on these two cards. I, I think, Ooh. you'll these, never be a good bank robber. <laughs> I think these <laughs> NICs will be the start of something bigger at the office, so next time we have stuff looked up, I will try to get, yeah, yeah. Yeah, agreed. After we were happy with it, I asked Asus for more cards. We're going to try to populate all of the systems with 10 gigabit cards. And Are they going to send a switch? <laughs> I don't, they didn't what, make a mine on them. <laughs> Asus doesn't make one. Damn I don't know it. if they make one on the not yet. small business side or not. Oh, but. I, ask. I don't think they make a 10 gig one yet. Mm -hmm. uh, like that's you know. Does eight, it have any gl or glued, glued to the bottom of it yet? I mean, we uh, have I don't a, know. We have a 16 <laughs> port. I think. Is it a 16? Is it eight port 10 gig? I don't know if it's eight or 16. I can't remember. The one that uh, the Jim bought. Yeah. That's an eight. Mm. That's not enough. He did not see, buy one, the two, several thousand three, dollar. Three, four, five, six, seven for Jim. We could make right. it. We could sacrifice. Eight to connect to the other switch. So eh, it's close. Alan, you don't get it. Um, <laughs> moving on. So so the, the yes. switch you have, how loud is that thing? So oh, very a loud. Couple of those. What? Wait, what? It's hot. Yeah, that Netgear switch oh, is very fans? loud. Yes. Oh, yeah. That thing yeah. is the obnoxious beast that should stay in a closet will we be able to fix the power consumption and heat of this through process advancement or are we stuck with hot 10 gigabit I ethernet stuck. controllers i mean it, i mean as far as them getting better yeah i mean these i'm sure draw less power than like the intel i mean like what 540. do you think that is on we could test that you know like that's probably on a very old note at this point like uh yeah i don't know because why would you it shrink could, it, it could for, be well unless well, remember shrinks only get you so far as far as like sure it takes it shrinks not necessarily because your heat your power silica, your distancy the, it's your, the power your density for the switching yeah, yeah, yeah of the thing yeah, you know <sighs> all right uh jeremy what do you got I don't know, I was kind of desperate as well, but uh, this sale was better than anything during the Steam Summer Sale. I uh, keep meaning to play the Homeworld Deserts of Karak um, because, well, Homeworld kicked ass. And it's ridiculously cheap right now. So if you haven't bothered to pick it up, uh, you can add it to your library for just under 20 bucks, and sometime in the next 12, 18 months, you might actually get a chance to play it. <laughs> it's really it does good. look interesting. And for that price, yeah, all right. I'll add it. Yeah, for twenty bucks, that's that's amazing. Hmm. Nifty, uh, George, George, George Werewolf, George Werewolf. Uh, you know what? I've always wanted one of these, and uh, we now kind of the, the time is right. What we were just talking about this in the office yesterday. Yeah, I was trying to what instant pot? Yeah, yeah, instant pot. I didn't end up buying it on the Prime. Sale. Did you buy it, Josh? Yeah, it was. It was it, no, not yet. I'm going to after we get some medical things done because um, it just uh, you know it's 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 a rice cooker, it's a pressure cooker, it does all kinds of things. Highly programmable. So explain um, to me a what a pressure button. cooker does. Okay, essentially a pressure cooker. So I, say like you've got an entirely frozen chicken. Say right? I did. <laughs> You put it in the egg port, you, you lock it up, you do the pressure cooking, and in 20 minutes, you've got a perfectly cooked chicken because it okay, increases the skylight. pressure inside of the, the pot while heating, allowing for much better heat transfer. The water and can so, get, uh, yeah, the, the water can get hotter before things. boiling. Oh, yeah, so yeah I mean, stuff won't boil. Oh, okay, so you put the right. items under higher pressure so that you can heat it further SDP, without maybe. boiling Increase, the water off. Increases the boiling I see, temperature I see. of the water. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, and, and like obviously, pressure cookers aren't a new technology, but a no. a fully digital pressure cooker is with timers it, and, it is, and is a newer thing yeah. and apparently is way easier to use than the older analog ones where they're kind of dangerous and it's a lot safer People do because they, they've got the analog ones uh, the ability yeah. to measure pressure inside and yeah. if something goes wrong to turn off yes rather than you <laughs> have you seen that yeah. picture of that, the pressure cooker happens. gone bad no yeah yeah that's what i meant you might have a new skylight when you get home yeah yeah if things yeah. go poorly so, so i've got to ask okay 
Why does it have a yogurt button? Make yogurt. With you make you make yogurt at a high temperature. Uh, well, I mean, it's I've a never made yogurt before on temperature. temperature well, but it's, it's, still a, it's a high. steady it right temperature. Here, yogurt maker. Yeah. I mean, you don't okay. you, do you don't make yogurt at the refrigerated temperature, like no. Just well, like you make you cherry pie, milk, and you yeah, put you it do. in the fridge. You need to accelerate the uh, you know the the bacteria, yeast stuff. Whatever. So is this yogurt only? Stuff. Let me let me ask you this. Uh, a pop culture quiz, everybody. This is only popular because like sous vide became a thing, and now like quick ways of like cooking conveniently are more popular. Because you said pressure cooker has been around yeah. for a while, and this this this. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's all chicken cooked in pressure cookers. Oh, is with, it? Okay. Yep. Twenty one oh, herbs yeah. and spices, or whatever the yeah. hell that is. So what I'm saying is, when does the Wi Fi connected <laughs> pressure exist. cooker? come out and when is it on kickstarter it's got to exist right? you can already Charlie. buy them and people are already getting upset because it decides to do uh, an update while they're trying to cook and of course <laughs> stops cooking to Fair. install the update and then it loses the internet connection and now you're stuck with a frozen chicken and a pressure cooker that ain't gonna work because it's got to be sod it's it's awesome. already part of the internet of shit cool all right uh alan so uh, I was looking for ways to tweak other stuff in Windows lately. Yeah, other stuff. Other stuff. Wink. Uh, stuff that you know you don't normally think to tweak, but actually is tweakable. Like for example, when you go to shut down or reboot Windows, and then it hits you with this prompt, like, "Hey, you got programs that like you know Notepad wants to save your document or something, right? Right? Like that'll stop the reboot. Just hold down the power button." Well, you don't have to do that. <laughs> There's actually a registry key that controls like whether or not the system waits on that stuff. Like you could just tell it, hey, just don't don't ever bother with that. Right, just right. just freaking reboot, because I told you to reboot, right? Damn it. So that's one of the tweaks. Uh and then the site that linked to that tweak had it grouped in with a like a batch of them, which is the more The tweaks. collection of best registry tweaks is speed up your windows. Yeah, but these were for, the tweaks were for Windows 7, but the majority of them still work, even all the way like through Windows 10, because they're just generic, like, yeah. you know, toggles for... Like what kind of stuff? What kind of, what kind of things we got? Uh, there's all, they're all listed under that, uh, like you can, um, it changes the timeout for how long, like if an app is hanging, like before it, you know, if you're just trying to close the app that was hanging, you know how to, you kind of have to sit there and wait for the window to right. kind of gray out. And then once you click X, you got to wait a little bit more for Windows to decide if it's like going to just Kill it. close it. And yep. Like you can reduce all those delays. I like this one. Uh, lo no low disk space checks. Nice. <laughs> that one, I think that one, I think might be a little <laughs> bit overkill. That one. Maybe like, that's what? important. I think we're beyond the point where everybody's <laughs> running out of the space on their C drive. Like, no, I mean, with SSDs, yeah, if that, that happens. But, I mean, the SSDs, I mean, no, I with guess. SSDs, that's going to happen. I guess. And I think you should want to know. I, I personally kind of want to know that one. Like, yeah, I might not use that one. But there's like, you know, uh, when you hover the mouse over something and you're waiting for the tooltip to show up, like yeah. there, it changes that timeout. So it's like almost instant. Okay. Wait to kill service timeout. No interrupt. No internet open with. <laughs> nice. Disable search on internet yeah. prompt in open yeah, with Windows. Disabled. If your shortcut is a broken link and Windows sits there and spins for like 20 seconds trying to like, oh, I'm looking for the program that this was, you right. know, it clearly doesn't I exist freaking anymore. deleted it. That's yeah. why the link's broken, right? Yeah. So it just it like gets rid of that stuff or shortens it or, you know, it's just a bunch of little tweaks. It's, just okay. like a, it's actually a relatively, like they list all of the registry entries that get done right. uh, on that, on that like second page there. And it's not that many. It's like a set of it's like ten no. ten keys or ten values hmm, like across five keys. So just, you know, interesting F tweaks. Find the we won't give you the URL for it. Find the link at the show notes uh for today. Yeah, we, links in the show notes. Know. There's not really a uh easy way to link that. Uh and then Alex, you had one as well. I did. What do you got for us? It's this little thing right here that I've been using for weeks now. It's the uh Corsair Scimitar? Scimitar. 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 I'm say scimitar. Scimitar. Yeah. Scimitar. It's got a really nice array button on the left side. Um, I've been using this for video editing, and can it's you, amazing. Can you use it like a number pad on the side of the freaking mouse? <laughs> yes. It's it actually is. It's, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Attached yeah. to a mouse. Yep. There you go. Huh. One, yeah, two, three, I, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I, I, eleven, twelve. I got twelve buttons. <laughs> the software is not bad. Um, I thought. I, th 
<laughs> too, bad there's no, too bad there's no ball in that mouse. Yeah. Because there was a ball rolling around in that video. So, you know. Uh, but, yeah, I, I was uh, pleasantly impressed by it. That's good. Because, I, and I will say, I agree with, with Ken. We, we oftentimes, the rest, others have to sit down at that desk and use the video editing machine. Um, it takes a little getting used to because I'm just kind of used to my thumb Resting going in on place something. there. Yeah. And if you do that, I mean, you can still kind of rest your thumb there, but you have to be lighter with it. Otherwise, you're going to accidentally hit yeah. one of those 12 mash, additional Mash buttons. a bunch of buttons. When you said you mapped volume to it, I right? Did. And like, I mean, I mean, obviously, I've used Premiere a lot, and that seems like it'd be an amazing thing. Like, yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. Mapping common Premiere functions to that or any sort of... You could of, map like cut, paste, mm -hmm. like yeah, just different... Yeah, you know. tension the volume. Yeah, I mean that seems yeah. like an awesome thing. <laughs> yeah, so, and it's low. It's not very expensive. It's a sixty nine dollar mouse. Yep. Hmm. That's yeah. surprisingly. Plus, it's got lights and shit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what it, are they it, coming out with the uh, mechanical version? Yeah, the mechanical switch. I, version. I want mechanical. Yeah. Keys yeah, you want on cherry, those. Yeah, I want cherry switches. Cherry on the, clues. <laughs> the, the side switches are mechanical. Oh, oh perfect. well, they they talk, they have like clicky. They're like mouse button mechanical. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're clicky mouses. They're not scissor switches. No, no, no. <laughs> not membranes. Yeah. Uh, all right, that's cool. Uh, before we end the show, we my, did get... Uh, my pick of the week is what? the second Asus Nick on your desk. Uh, oh, so, oh, the other one? So which which serial number do you want? Uh, I'll take... One. Higher one. Okay, you get 190. I'll take 189. Okay. Oh, okay. You think that probably is the 189th and 190th of these cards? It would seem likely. Because the serial number ends in 000190. <laughs> yeah, that's probably the case. There's other stuff before it, but like hex, you know, text and whatnot. So there you go. If anybody wants limited, like first run, limited cards, there you go. 000190. We'll get 189. Anyway, we had two Patreon uh, contributions. Bim Paras pledged $3. Thank nice. you, Bim. And Edsel Mal Malasig. Malasig? Edsel? Six ninety nine, six ninety nine was pledged. So it's thank you to it's both a, Edsel and Bim. Thank you. There was an exclamation point at the end of that name, or is that just and part of the sentence? You. I think that is uh, always. Oh, okay. yes, it is. Uh, Patreon wants to be very exclamatory about somebody's giving you money. Yeah, donation, yeah. like that type of thing. So thank you guys very much for that. Super, super appreciated. Uh, that's gonna be the end of the show. PCPer.com slash podcast is where you can find all the show notes to uh, our discussion today. So if you want to look up a story or review or uh, a, a pick of the week that we had, um, all the links are there. So pcpro.com slash podcast. It's also where you find like the YouTube videos, the RSS to download the MP3 or the video file or whatever you want to do. Uh, all that is available there. Um, and that's it. We will be back next week with another episode of the PC Perspective Podcast. I don't think I said that word all the way. But I'm you know, that's, that's real I'll, optimistic thinking on I'll your part. Back. I yes, no, I I am nothing if not optimistic all of the time, 100. percent uh, I almost said 100 days of the year, which is maybe more accurate. <laughs> that seems more accurate. Actually, yeah, yeah. Everything sucks. Oh, hey, payday. <laughs> no, that would assume I get paid every third day. That does not. That's definitely not the case. Mm -hmm. All right, oh, everybody. Can we move to that? That'd be nice. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, okay. You get three dollars. Sending, sending checks to Canada is very expensive. It's three dollars. You have to subtract out the postage. You need two American flag stamps, as we found out. That's true. It's very true. All uh, right, everybody. Yes. See you next week. I'm Ryan Trout. I'm Jeremy Helstrom. I'm Josh Walrus. And I'm Alan Malentano. And then there's Ken. And then there's Alex. Good night. Good night. And Johnny Boy. And. If you enjoyed this content, consider supporting in-depth technical content by contributing at patreon.com slash pcper.